LinkedIn News. From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. It's our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. We've been talking lately about some of the big and ephemeral parts of our lives, at work and beyond, how to come out about who we really are, how to resolve harm, how to face fear, how to lead. Today is all about how we can, if we want to, make a big creative impact. My guests team teach a popular class at Stanford University's D School, and they've just published a book. It's called Creative Hustle, Blaze Your Own Path and Make Work That Matters. Olatunde Shabomahin and Sam Seidel believe everyone is born creative. They've devised a framework to help us make the most of that creativity, and we're going to review it today. To get started, we need to dive into what Tunde and Sam mean when they say the words creative hustle. They define it succinctly in the book, and I used it as a jumping off point for our conversation. They say, creative hustle is the alchemy of imagination and ambition that will enable you to apply your gifts to your goals. Ugh, I love that. So here are Tunde and Sam. Sam speaks first. Well, first of all, Jesse, thank you for having us, and thank you for echoing that quote back to us. It's something that uh, we, we wrote a, a while ago and speaks to something we both believe very deeply, um, which is both uh, that there is this balance that every one of us can find um, between imagination and ambition, between um, being creative and figuring out how to like make things happen in the world. Um, that's really important, especially if we want to see this world become a more beautiful, more just place for all of us and for future generations. So we believe Creative Hustle is exactly that. It's that balance of having the vision, seeing things in ways that maybe they haven't been seen, and also figuring out how to then make moves uh, toward bringing some of those things into reality. I want to talk about those two words a second. Um, Let's start with hustle. Hustle can mean a lot of different things. And in fact, in recent years, particularly in the wake of the uh, uh, pandemic, kind of avoided it a little bit. Tunde, why is that the right word for y'all? You're right. It has a lot of different meanings. And in the communities that I'm familiar with, hustle can mean everything from an illegal activity to the work ethic and the grind that you put on a daily basis to achieve a, a real positive goal. And we wanted to call on that spirit of action and activity and persistence and pair that with the word creative, which speaks about um, imagination and, and, and bigness. And so take real hard persistence to achieve the things that you want to achieve and, and make that really big. What we wanted to do with Creative Hustle, though, was not get trapped into this idea around side hustle. We didn't want it to be, this is a small thing that you're going to do on the side, not to, not to knock side hustles, but this wasn't about, you know, an adjacent thing to some, to some other bigger purpose. This wasn't even about just simply money. This is about big meaning. This is about what your whole core purpose is. And so we felt like Creative Hustle grabbed and spoke to our audience about what that would look like. And that audience is anyone who wants to better flex their creative muscles. Sam and Tunde teach at Stanford's D School. Now, I've written a ton about it over the years because it's unusual, like really cool. It's not its own design school, but instead it's a cross-disciplinary program at Stanford. It exists to help students in every discipline, from engineering and medicine to teaching, to unlock their creativity in service of solving really hard problems. I think at the core, what we're trying to get at is being able to look at anything from as small as one aspect of something in an individual's life to societal systems and see things in ways that they may not be popularly or commonly seen. That can mean being artistic and, and working visually. That can mean being artistic and working in verse or in harmony. But that can also mean working within some, you know, maybe more um, traditional mediums uh, and just approaching them in new ways and trying to apply them in new ways. So one of the things we saw in, in the class that we taught or, or called Creative Hustle was students who in and of themselves were hybrid, right? So like they might be a medical student who loves music and they're finding how they can merge those things. They've been told perhaps that 
Those have to be completely compartmentalized, and they're figuring out where the value can be in actually breaking down some of the walls, even between parts of themselves. And so there's just tremendous creative potential, even in um, putting together pre-existing things in, in new ways and new combinations. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your collaboration with each other. Tunde, you come from a really interesting background. Tell us a little bit about Street Code Academy. Yeah, Street Code Academy um, was birthed from my passion to, you know, do what the essence of creative hustle is, which is to make my impact on the world, make it positive, make it big, make an impression. And I asked the question in 1998, coming to Stanford University, what's going to be our civil rights issue of our era? We known in history's past that it may look like let's bring voting rights to be just, let's, um, f- let's free uh, African-Americans from slavery, let's uh, give everyone the right to go to school wherever they want and not have legal segregation, right? We had all these fights, but what's going to be our issue? And Jesse Jackson posed it in a really impactful way, which was that economic empowerment was this generation's civil rights struggle and technology was going to help do that. And so what I wanted to do with Street Code Academy was to do my part in helping folks see that they could be a part of economic empowerment, they could be part of creation, they could be a part of innovation. And so Street Code Academy is a nonprofit based in East Palo Alto um, in the heart of Silicon Valley, yet overlooked and and left out of a lot of the uh, resources to kind of make innovation happen at the level it had, and it can. Um, And we offer free technology classes in design, in entrepreneurship, and in coding. And Tunde, here I think it is really important for those of our listeners who haven't been to Palo Alto to understand this fundamental structural truth about Palo Alto, which is that it somehow pairs the incredible resources of Stanford University and the big brains that live on campus um, and one of the poorer areas of the state. And and those areas are, if, if I'm correct, and you can probably correct me here, they're within a mile of each other, mm-hmm. right? In Absolutely. the same geographic location. How do you see those two communities living alongside each other? Well, I, I've, I've always felt like um, we've been, as overlooked communities, been so misunderstood, right? And so um, the income of a community, while East Palo Alto is poor um, by financial income, it's rich in cultural vibrancy and 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 it's rich in ambition, it's rich in compassion. And so I think that a school like Stanford that has been at the heart of innovation, that is that is rich in resource and opportunity and history can pair so beautifully when these communities come together because they share the goal of making impact in the world. They share the goal of creating new things and doing it in a very new way. And so what happens when we bring those communities together? I think that's what Creative Hustle, the class, really proved that when these communities do come together, there's so much you can share. We brought 15 students from East Palo Alto area through Street Code Academy and 15 students from Stanford University. All of them were diverse. All of them had goals. All of them had a, a, a set of education, but they came from these different avenues and you couldn't tell the difference in our Creative Hustle class. There was a shared synergy that they all brought. So I do think that that was a model for how these communities can live together. And when we do bring them together, there's so much that we benefit um, each other. When Sam and Tunde brought people from Stanford and people from East Palo Alto together for their first creative hustle class, they were looking to create a community. It was about making something larger together. Here's Sam. The ethos, as you probably already picked up from what Tunde was sharing, is like, how do we all come in and share the brilliance, the assets, the creativity, the entrepreneurial spirit that that we have in whatever forms that takes, and how do we get stronger and better from learning from each other? So partially, it was an opportunity for us to play with that idea and say, what, is, what does that look like in practice? What does it take for us to set the stage for that to happen? And then what, what might come of it? And one of the beautiful things we saw come of it is that the relationships persisted beyond the, the course itself. So um, running into students from the uh, the course together out in the world um, because they made this connection in the class that persisted is, is a, a, a very gratifying piece and I think was a kind of a, a confirmation to us that there's something that can happen pretty quickly if we create um, the right context, the right container for that kind of synergy to bubble up. The other piece that we learned 
um, was just really starting to get to the genesis of what we have in the book, right? Because the way we structured the class was by bringing in a couple of uh, really brilliant, diverse, uh, and I mean that in terms of race and culture, but I also mean it in terms of like what their creative hustles are, right? So folks who do really different things in the world, but all are super accomplished, that we just genuinely, when I say we, I mean Tunde and I, admire, and putting them up on stage in front of our students and saying, like, let's deconstruct together. What did these three people do? They look different. They work in different mediums. They're all having like real success and feeling like they're living in line with their values and what they're trying to put into the world and they're making it happen. Like, what are we seeing across these three that we can learn from? And so through that practice that we invited our students into with us to deconstruct that, we began to start to identify the pieces that we then lay out in the book around what are the components of uh, all these successful creative hustles, no matter what walk of life they come from, no matter what artistic or business discipline they land in. So that's the genesis for the creative hustle framework. Now we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, Tunde and Sam teach us the framework itself and how to apply it. And we're back. Wherever you are in your personal and professional journey, Tunde and Sam want you to feel empowered by their framework and their tools. They're going to walk us through them. Tunde starts us off. The framework starts with gifts. And I love that because, you know, we ourselves are parents. We, we know enough parents. We know enough kids. We've been kids ourselves to know that our gifts become pretty evident pretty early on. And we can see, and other people can see where our gifts lie. But it's so beautiful to be able to write those down and self-identify what do I have as a gift, right? So that's where the framework starts. Then you go to the other end, almost like that barbell you mentioned, but you go all the way to the end. That's the start. And the end is these goals. What do I want to make happen in the world? And we say, think big, be correct. I mean, and here's a chance to, and this helps me just to write down what do I really want to do in the world? Very few times in my life have I been asked that and given a chance to just write that. Then there are three lanes that connect those two um, bookends, if you will. And the three lanes are principles, people, and practice. What are the principles that you know are going to ground you and almost be your anchor for how you move throughout the world? How are you going to leverage the people inside of your network and community of, 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 um, th- that you've been given? And, and then what are the practices on a daily, weekly, et cetera, basis that you're going to actually put in to action to accomplish these things? That framework led to some really great breakthroughs with our students and, and with myself, frankly. I love that. I'm, I'm going to pass over to Sam before I start talking here. I, I love it, too. And it's just so it's so cool to hear Tunde share it in such a concise way, because I hope hearing that it sounds almost like simple and, and maybe almost obvious. And at the same time, I think it's really profound because it comes from a lot of conversations with people who are just incredibly accomplished at making beautiful things happen in the world and unpacking how did they get there. And so within each of those kind of lanes that Tunde laid out, there's so many gems of like, okay, so how do you figure out what that North Star is, the principles, the values that you might follow? How do you remind yourself of it consistently? And looking to these creative hustlers we admire to to learn, how do they do that? How do you find those people? Of course, like the people you're going to grow and build with and maybe people you you're going to kind of like feel a little competitive with and, and like, if, you know, have that energy. And then, you know, with practices like there's there's so many. How do you get started? How do you find the things you can take action on now um, and build into your life? And we've been learning that from each other. Like I assume I hope you don't mind if I share what you texted me this morning. Um, but one of the one of the personal practices I share in the book, which I certainly didn't invent. I think I learned it from uh, an author of a book called The Artist's Way. It's about oh, yeah. mor- morning pages and writing uh, just consistently. And for me, it's morning page. I actually purposely limit myself to one page because I don't want to overdo it. I want to leave myself hungry for the next morning. And I shared that in the book as a practice of mine. And you know, this morning I get this beautiful text from Tunde showing me that his book of morning pages he's been doing for the last month. So just the way that we get to like pick up those things and start to take action and try them on for size um, has been really, really uh, gratifying and something that we want for our students and we want for our readers now. I love that exercise for our listeners, Morning Pages, which I think we've talked about on the show before, but it's been a couple of years and which is a tool in my own arsenal. I, I rely on it. The trick to Morning Pages, 
at least as it's detailed in the artist's way, is, is twofold. One, just write. Don't think about what you're writing. Just put the pen on the paper. And I don't mean a computer keyboard. I mean the pen on the paper. Yes. And two, don't look at it again. That's not the point. This is not a document of record by any stretch of the imagination. This is a conversation you're having out loud with yourself. Right, Sam? Absolutely. And I just want to reiterate yeah. like one hack that like I've really <laughs> found helpful. You could do it by time or you could do it by space in the notebook. But where, where I used to go awry is I would do it for a few days, but it'd turn into 45 minutes. I'd be writing all, I'd be exhaustive. And then the next morning, I'd kind of feel like I said everything I had to say yesterday. It took so much time. I didn't get to other things. And then I would kind of fall off. And the thing that has made it a consistent practice has been this like limitation, the constraint that I've imposed on myself to say, when that page is full, if, if I do it in five minutes, great. If it takes me 15, okay. But when that page is full, I'm done for the morning. So it may not be one page for you, but I think if for me, a hack to like staying with it is to have some limitation or constraint that you place on it yourself. That is a wonderful, wonderful tip. You talk in this book about the, the importance of people and knowing your network and how much people matter. How do you nurture your network? How do you take care of your community? And what does that even mean to you? I mentioned to Sam, one of the practices I was trying to do was just be grateful every morning. And so my first moment of gratitude was for Sam for, for sharing that practice. But there are so many concrete, specific examples in this book that can give inspiration for how do you live this out. And one of them comes with Sarai that I think is a beautiful practice of and a beautiful notion that takes care of your community. The title of the chapter is Receive Better So You Can Give Better. And I love that because it speaks about listening to our community, right? If I receive from my community, if I'm open to receive, I'm learning from practices, I'm being better because of listening to Sam's practice and I'm growing. And so that, that listening allows you to then give more. And so I, that cycle of generosity is a, is a great, great piece. I think we speak a lot about giving, but we don't speak a lot about receiving. And I think her being able to receive advice from somebody being able, me being able to receive inspiration from Sam, not to mention I had to receive a lot for the book. I was just on a sabbatical. I had to receive a lot. That receiving fills me up and allows me to be able to give more. And I love that I got that inspiration from, uh, from Sarai's chapter in our book. I love that chapter. Just give me one line on the story itself. Who is Sarai and what is her story? Sarai is this widely recognized, been recognized by the White House, Forbes 30 Under 30, really accomplished entrepreneur who has created an app to help um, largely undocumented communities find their way to college. But she's able to do this because she herself went through that experience. She came to the United States, really hardworking, very accomplished, and was told by a counselor, despite the fact that she was accomplishing academically, that you have no way to go to college. But there was another person who believed in her at her church who said, no, you can, and here's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna find the right people. And Sarai was able to receive that. She didn't accept the first answer. She was able to receive help from a number of different people and was not only able to pursue this college dream for herself, but create a tool that now helps thousands of people. And so she's able to give more, right, in a way that's recognized by some of the best in our world by receiving that, that generosity from other people like Sister Freeman in our church. There's another way to look at the practice piece of the framework. Reframe them as rituals. I love thinking about them this way. It makes the habits we're working on feel very special. Here's Sam. Well, that brings to mind another amazing creative hustler that we had the opportunity to spend time with and ended up featuring in the book, uh, Tessa. And um, one, one of the rituals that Tessa shared with us was a morning routine, which includes a bunch of really healthy <laughs> ways to start the day. But the one that, that really stuck with, with me was um, this morning conversation with her mom and starting the day that way to make sure that she stays grounded in her values. She's a very successful marketing executive, um, could easily give you a thousand reasons why she didn't have time to do that every day. Um, but she also knows that that is the way to make sure that all of those thousand things she does after that phone call stay in line with who she is, where she comes from, and what she wants to be and embody in the world. It's a beautiful, I think, very um, simple ritual that um, 
she she shared with us and that has really influenced um, my life kind of kind of in the way that Tunde has taken inspiration uh, maybe on the morning page or pages I've taken inspiration from that practice of, of Tessa's and um, just the, the the beauty of that ritual. Another practice jumped out at me when I read the book, and that's the importance of researching. Sam has a great story about this, featuring Sean Heider, who wrote and directed the film Coda. Well, full disclosure, Sean is a, a, pretty much a lifelong friend of mine. We went to high school really? together and wrote, yes, yeah, and wrote skits for uh, uh, the school play together. And so I've, I've been an admirer of her dramatic talent um, and writing talent, uh, really, for most of my life, right? For more than my entire adult life. The amazing thing about Sean even being in this book is that when I reached out to her, I didn't know anything about CODA. And for folks who don't know, CODA just won both the Critics Award and the Audience Award at Sundance and went on to win the, the big Oscars of this past year. And just an incredible trajectory for this kind of independent film that um, Sean and her team created. But when I reached out, I was really just thinking about actually the work she did on her first film, how long it took and how she stuck with it and what she had sort of explained to me about how much she learned in the process. The previous film was about the mother-child relationship. Sean is like a deep researcher, whatever the topic she's working on. And part of what I thought was so beautiful in the conversations we had with her specifically as we were working on this book and, and exploring, like learning from her about creative hustle was the ways that she does kind of what we might call more traditional research, like desk research, reading, attending events, that sort of thing. And the way she does what we might call me search, which is like this other side of research, which is really looking inward. Um, so that example of her becoming a mother and that becoming part of her research, not that she had her children for the purpose of making this film, but as she did, like the opportunity that that opened up to do that self-examination. And she shared stories with us about CODA and the creation of, of that story and that film, and how she was looking at her childhood, her family, and also interrogating who she is and what stories should or shouldn't be hers to tell and what her role is in telling those stories in, in just a really impressive way. Part of what I liked was like, yes, at the headline level, do your research. Whatever your creative hustle is, there's no way around that. You have to um, dig in and really study the game that you're playing. But what I loved about Sean's story was that research isn't just about hopping on your favorite search engine and typing in some keywords. It includes that, but it's much more dynamic. It's much more human centered and it's much more introspective and doing as much looking in as you are looking out. As you worked on this class together, as you worked on this book together, Tunde and Sam, where did where were your own ideas and thoughts pushed? What do you know now that you didn't know going into this? Well, I think um, I've grown tremendous amounts. Anything you do collaboratively, you grow. And, and we talk about people being one of the central or the central lane. Uh, to be able to grow my relationship uh, with Mr. Sam Seidel has has pushed me as a person. We talk about the practice, but also, um, you know, he's pushed me as a writer. Uh, he's extremely poetic. Um, his, 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 the way he writes is whatever you did in your high school <laughs> to have a, a Sam Seidel and a Sean Hever competitor <laughs> uh, salute to that English uh, teacher and whoever yeah. English department needs a standing ovation. So I've grown in relationship, but I think also... I walked away from this knowing that, look, I can evolve as a human being. And I never, Jesse, to tell you the truth, never saw myself as an author. I, my one life goal, I have a few, but one of them was have a book be dedicated to me. That, that was the goal because I was a youth developer. I said, I want to see somebody who's going to go write a book. And I want to encourage them so much that they say, I'm one of those people they dedicated to. I never in a million years would have thought that I would be a co-author. And so, it, 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 but it speaks to the evolution and our permission to grow over time and to, and to look at the resources that we have in front of us, look at the relationships we have in front of us, look at the opportunities and see how did my principles adapt in that particular season. And in this particular season, given the relationships I have with the people like Sam and the D school, given the opportunities um, provided, I'm able to grow and say that I can now see myself as, as an author. And that's, that's life-changing. I hope you, in, even if you didn't do it externally or in any written form, internally dedicated this book to yourself. <laughs> I love that. 
How about you, Sam? Yeah. I mean, first of all, uh, Tunde, thank you for the shout out to the English teachers. Um, and I just would love if you'll indulge me just to say their names, Joan Sobel, Jack Cruzy, and Donald Burroughs. Um, rest in peace to Donald, who, who passed away recently, and all three of whom I believe Sean and I shared. Those three were hugely influential to me, and I, I think to Sean as well. So thank you for, for pointing that out. I think it's so important. In terms of how I've grown, I mean, so much. I think the, the brotherhood and the relationship with Tunde is, is in the forefront of my mind. Um, what a gift. And going back to your earlier question about how you nurture a network, I think one way is to engage in a creative project with folks. There's a closeness that gets developed that is really powerful. The other piece for me is the, the visual aspect. I mean, one thing we haven't spoken about at all yet is just how visual this book is. Um, and we had the opportunity to work with just incredible artistic minds from the D school, um, as well as uh, colleagues that were brought in just to help bring the ideas in this book to life visually. And I'm, I, I, I've been an author for over 10 years. I had an earlier book called Hip Hop Genius, and that book focused pretty heavily on the story of a guy named David T.C. Ellis. T.C. is also featured as one of the nine folks that are featured in this book. To get to feature him where you can see him in beautiful photo form with visual collage, where the boldness of his words are matched with the boldness of the print on the page, and, and thinking through all of the complex questions of how to not have that be a distraction, how to not have that get in the way, but to really help facilitate the experience for the reader who's digging in and trying to understand, just like we are, what can I learn from TC? How can I channel the courage that he channels and, and shares in his story? Um, to have that brought to life in such visual and aesthetic ways um, is one, a gift, but for me, was just in a tremendous learning experience. And Tunde can tell you, like, on the calls where we were talking about the text in the book, I was like, the guy who probably couldn't shut up. You know, it was like, I had all these opinions about tone and language and all this stuff. And in the calls where it was like, how do we bring this to life visually? I was just like the fly on the wall, just trying to like learn and understand it and getting to hear from folks who have such um, incredible eye uh, for how to put together hand lettering with a photograph, with an illustration to bring meaning uh, to I was about to say readers, it's readers, but also almost like viewers of the book um, has just been, I, I never want to go back. I mean, I want to do more books and I want them all to be at least this visual because it's just been such an incredible experience um, learning alongside these artists. That was Olatunde Shabomahin and Sam Seidel. Their book, Creative Hustle, is out now. Let's discuss the Creative Hustle framework this week on Hello Monday Office Hours. You know Office Hours, it's that time every week, 3 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays, when we get together to connect in person. Bring your coffee, bring your tea, bring your lunch, whatever you want, just show up. You can always find us on LinkedIn's news page at 3 p.m. Eastern, Wednesdays, or drop an email if you need help finding the link to hellomonday at linkedin.com. We'll send it to you. If you like the show, please follow and review it wherever you get your podcasts and share it with a friend. Thanks so much. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn News. Sarah Storm produces our show with mixing by Joe DeGiorgi. Courtney Koop is head of original programming. Dave Pond is head of news production. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor are two of our people, and we're so lucky. Our theme music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. We'll be back next Monday. Thanks for listening.